three years, Carnegie has been running a civic research network, which is a group of experts working on civil society from a number of different countries around the world. And we've been studying how civil society is changing around the world and what this means for the future of global democracy. Many people have studied what happens in the moment of large-scale protests, but then there's the question of what happens when protests die down. Do activists move into mainstream politics? Do they uh, adjust their civic activist strategies? Are they effective in what comes after the protests or not? So this is a really big and relatively under-researched uh, question that is very, very important politically and, and which we're now studying in this network. There have been uh, several recent protests in Romania during the past few years, uh, mainly in response to the government's uh, measures perceived to undermine the fight against corruption. Uh, and despite the apathy that has traditionally characterized Romanian citizens in the past, uh, these mass protests have actually grown in size and the repertoire is used uh, by the activists. So in terms of numbers, if in 2012 there were a few thousand protesters, by 2017 we have almost half a million uh, protesters in the streets. And this shows that civil society has become an increasingly prominent actor on the Romanian political scene. There have been two episodes of protests in Thailand. One is uh, the political protest between the two political camps that are in conflict with each other. We call that the red and yellow protest. And the second episode was the, the anti-military rule protest, which took place after the military taking over of the democratic government. So these protests, the two episodes, are the continuation of political conflicts in Thailand that have divided society into different political camps. One is the progressive, the other is the conservative, and these two camps uh, play out in now our uh, political system. Basically, we have parties that represent these two ideologies. Um, it was the first time I would claim that we have these ideological parties, um, but also there's an emerging political cleavage um, within the electoral um, system, which reflects the generation gap between the younger generation and the older generation. The, the efforts that the Ethiopian people have put in place, and I think so far they are a miracle <laughs> in Africa. The protests in Ethiopia are rooted in a, in a long struggle. Uh, to start with, but the most recent ones have really been triggered by grievances that uh, many protesters have had and uh, perhaps the most recent from 2015 up to 2019 are really about deep-seated reforms that are necessary for that country. I think there are major reforms that have taken place in the post-protest situation. I think um, uh, the change of, 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 of leadership is a major thing, and uh, not just change of leadership like we see in other countries, but also the new leader that has come uh, and is now the new Prime Minister of Ethiopia has undertaken immense number of reforms in less than a year. So I do think that there is a positive vibe around which uh, we should look at the, the, the protests in Ethiopia. Brazil has undergone very significant political changes in the past few years. We cannot understand these changes without considering the role of civic mobilizations, the role of street protests. So the protests eventually led to the ousting of President Dilma Rousseff in 2016 and also had important impacts in the presidential election of 2018. After the protests, there were leaders that emerged from the protests that took the pathway of institutionalization, that went into electoral politics, and some of them did very well in the 2018 uh, elections. Others went to build new civil society organizations, new civic platforms that also had an important impact on the 2018 elections. So protests in Brazil have had a long-lasting and very important impact on significant political events. Primarily, the question is also about why the protests and what they were opposed to and the commonalities there because many a times authoritarianism, corruption, um, gender equality, students movements, a lot of these protests actually come up at a national scale because of their urge to change. 
In terms of India, like 2010 to 15, the very clear shadows that we followed in the protest movement, they changed the regime a corrupt regime, uh, uh, a regime that was refusing to bring in a law to protect women, a regime that was land grabbing from the poor, a regime that was problematic on different counts. Now what have they achieved is a part, what has happened to the protests? That was the key area that we were looking at in this whole effort. There are a huge number of countries around the world that have seen really large scale protests in uh, the last few months and, and years. The post-protest issue is one that's really difficult analytically, but it's also one of really significant policy relevance. Uh, civic activists themselves need to learn how to be more effective once their protests die down. International organizations like the EU put huge amounts of money into supporting civil society, but often this money is quite separate from the kind of protest activity that we've seen erupt around the world. And we've discussed here how, in a very concrete policy sense, all this money needs to be better linked to the way that activists are thinking about their political strategies uh, in the months and years after their very large-scale protests have taken place.